Welcome to Voices of Vyana. Today, we're thrilled to have Ruchi Kapoor, EVP of Growth Strategy and Analytics at Vyana, who is a seasoned professional with a rich background in strategy, finance, and analytics. Ruchi has a proven track record in developing data-driven insights and steering long-term growth. In this episode, join us as Ruchi discusses her career journey, the nuances of developing strategy, and effective data utilization. I'm your host Rashmi Shri Raghavan and I'm Akshaya Shankar. Get ready for an impactful conversation with Ruchi. Welcome Ruchi. Thank you ladies, happy to be here. So Ruchi, can you take us through your career journey, how it started and what it morphed into today? Is it something you'd always envisioned for yourself? Sure. I started with an enterprise software company as a product applications engineer. Then I got into consulting because I thought it would be a good personality fit and it was gave me exposure to a bunch of different industries and I like the variety and experience so when i got out of consulting which turned out to be a serious lifestyle upgrade because i could get a dog and i didn't have to travel as much <laughs> anymore uh, i was concerned about staying put in one place and in one job fortunately that didn't turn out to be the case i worked at a mortgage company i worked first in analytics then as an internal consultant on special projects the marketing the strategy So that turned out to be a good fit too because it gave me experience in a bunch of different roles. I wouldn't say I envisioned any of this for myself. I've never thought more than a few years out, still don't, because whatever I envision will change with the new information. I want to remain open to whatever ideas or opportunities come my way. I don't want to be limited to a vision that was developed when I was stupid. And every few years, I think I was stupid a few years ago. <laughs> Let's start with the intersection of data and strategy. Can data be a source of competitive advantage for companies? Absolutely. So when using a product results in data and the product's value increases with more data, we get a network effect. That's a serious, serious competitive advantage because a competitor could come up with an identical product or even a better product, but without the network using it, it wouldn't offer as much value to the customer. Ruchi, can you give us some examples? Uh, let me use examples of products everyone is familiar with. So Google search, like back in the day before you guys were born, uh, using the product resulted in new data, and learning from this data made the search engine smarter and show more relevant results, which made people use the product even more. And pretty soon they had next to no competition because of this network effect. So can you tell the difference when you use a different search engine? Can you tell the difference in the quality of your search results? Yeah. Yeah. So, is that like products going viral? Not exactly. Viral effects are different. So, viral growth is when our existing customers turn into advocates and get us more new customers, ideally for free. Uh, that comes from using, you know, the right language and optimizing for the emotional payload of this user who's sharing the product or the idea. Like, what's the thing that's going to convert them into an advocate? and the product has to be designed for that to happen for it to be you know it has to be really tested iteratively to make sharing happen easily and have the sharing bring us new users who then become advocates themselves so viral growth usually happens as part of a growth loop like something that has a beginning and an end and by the end of it the company would have acquired a large number of users either for free or for very little so that will end up with a lower customer acquisition cost or a greater speed of adoption that's a completely different objective from adding defensibility to our product which is longer term so the defensibility comes from every customer adding incremental value to all the other customers of the product and in this specific case we're talking about that defensibility coming from new data that's generated when the product is used so if i'm understanding this correctly what you're seeing is that it creates a pretty strong barrier to entry right network it can sometimes so if data is really central to the benefit that the product offers then yes it can be a strong barrier to entry if data is only marginal to the product then not so much so uh so i think of an example netflix at one point thought their recommendation engine was going to be a real differentiator they figured as we learn more about people's behavior our recommendation engine will get smarter from all that data and we will produce so much delight that people won't want to get off their couch or go to a different platform 
that's not how that played out right so i've got other places i can get recommendations from i get recommendations from word of mouth from my family and friends from social media from critics from reviewers on traditional media i don't go in and fix for the recommendation right i go for the content and i'm pretty sure they learn everything they could about me given all the hours of my life <laughs> if i die they'll be able to build their own ruchi but that's not stopping me from going to other platforms the other challenge is that even when data is central to the product's value having more data doesn't always translate into more value so there's a limit to the incremental value add from incremental data so look at wearable devices like fitness trackers for most people there's a limit of limit to how much of that data they can consume and act on so where the chain breaks down is where you have to make lifestyle changes based on that data and you've got limited time and bandwidth you've got a day job you're not sitting around trying to use all the data you get from your apple watch or from your fitbit which is why that space is all about coming up with new devices for niche customer segments who have very specific use cases like who have health issues or like you know people who are into hiking who use the google pixel watch or the garmin instinct for health and trail navigation that's a very specific use case so it's not about providing the average user with more and more data because there's a point at which that value as it does so can you tell me a little bit more about how apple watch is probably fit into this so the apple watch has a defensibility there because apple devices all talk to each other which wasn't the bar before apple made it a thing we didn't care about our devices talking to each other but we do now right it's it is a real value add and also there is more to the product than just a fitness tracker right there are more product features in the apple watch than just the fitness tracker and they have a great brand so that's not something a new player can easily compete with so do large companies have a better shot at creating such a defensibility with data because they have so much data they do they have a better shot at a scale effect so large companies have more data by definition uh, but does that data get created with increased usage and does that data create meaningful value for customers that is what a network effect takes but if you are operating at an unbeatable scale and the sheer volume of data you've got allows you to create value that wouldn't be possible otherwise yes that's a, that is a competitive advantage like with facebook ads they wouldn't be able to attract the advertising spend from organizations that they currently do if it weren't for their scale so if that data wasn't getting generated continuously on facebook if they were buying external data and mining it a anybody can do it right and b there would be a lag and a loss of accuracy that could potentially make the offering meaningless like if you were shown ads for i don't know bridal wear right after you got married it would be pretty pointless so facebook has scale i understood that but it doesn't have network effects so I mean, it does it absolutely does like any social network the more people that are on facebook the greater its value to us to every user or more the conversation we'll be missing out on if we choose not to join that social network when i said scale i was talking of facebook ads which is only a thing because of facebook's large user base right a competitor wouldn't be able to do that unless they had a comparable amount of data for effective targeting and a comparable number of eyeballs to grab so how can a company go about creating a network effect with data I don't know that a company can go about creating a network effect or any defensibility at will if it doesn't make sense for the business they're in. But I'll talk about the elements that need to be in place so that a network effect can be created with data. I'm repeating myself here, but data has to be core to the product value. If it's only peripheral, there's only so much of a moat you can create with it, and the customer has to care for that value. So I'll take another example. Let's take Zomato. that definitely has an effect effect on data so the greater the number of reviews for restaurants and the greater num- the number of restaurants with reviews the more the value to me as a user so data is central to this value to restaurant discovery and as a customer i care about that value the more people visit restaurants and review them the more this data gets generated and it's useful data the minimum number of reviews has to be pretty substantial right if every restaurant in zomato has thousands of reviews and you pair comes in with five five reviews up to five reviews each it's not going to be a real competitor 
the new player would have to onboard those many restaurants or a comparable number of restaurants, get a large number of reviews, maybe not as many as Zomato does, but there is there's a point of diminishing returns. So by the time a restaurant has thousands of reviews, every new review is not adding incremental value, right? It's still a defensibility. So there is a point of diminishing returns. It's far away, which is why there aren't too many players in this space. I mean, it's not as much of a defensibility as, as you know, so as to allow somebody a monopoly of this space. But it is, it is not easy to get those many restaurants on board, those many users using your app, reviewing these restaurants. Like all of that content, all of that data has to be created from scratch. And how do the advances in AI factor in here? Um, and how can startups best leverage it to their advantage? I know there's been a lot of talk about how most value in the space and generative AI will accrue to incumbents. I think it will also accrue to startups and it depends. So it's not like AI will disrupt every market in a way that benefits startups. That depends on whether AI's primary effect in their space is disruptive or not. So here, what do you mean by disruptive? So disruptive innovation creates new markets as opposed to improving something that already exists. Forget what that's called. There's a word for that. Sustaining innovation. That's like improving existing stuff. So examples of disruptive innovation would be like Uber, which created new supply that didn't exist before. Disrupted the existing supply side of the market, which was established taxi companies at the time. right? Or the iPhone, which disrupted the smartphone market at first. And then over time, so many other markets. So that same kind of delayed reaction will likely happen with generative AI as well. So back to earlier question, AI can be used for sustaining innovation as well, like AI applied ad targeting on Facebook. So this is a way in which it could help an established player maintain its lead. So the underlying market dynamics or the business model don't change much here, right? It's, it's still Facebook ads, you're applying AI to it. So they're improved by use of a new technology. So AI, AI as a technology is not inherently disruptive or sustaining that depends on how it's used so to answer your question how startups leverage it is about whether their product or market is better served with disruptive innovation or by improving and refining with ai what already exists so if it fundamentally unlocks something that was unimaginable without it or if it undercuts an existing business model like the user experience created by llms they undermine the product features that drive google's ad business so that's where ai is disruptive qualities can be put to use, especially in markets where incumbents are known to move slowly or where there's potential for a new user experience. Like if you think about companies that dominated earlier platform shifts, like Google or Facebook or Uber, like we just spoke about, they created a user experience that made the underlying new technology very accessible to people. They provided a new user experience. So that is something startups can think about um, or where startups can find unstructured data that's valuable and accessible. Competing with them in a space where they're already successfully using it as a staining innovation is a little harder, but that can be done. So if the industry as a whole grows with the introduction of a new technology, usually what happens is new niches are created that incumbents are either not interested in serving or not good at serving or that they don't know about. Like if you think of the music industry, uh, and if you think of the new technology as streaming, it created new niches, right? Like subscription music hubs, like Spotify, or new distribution channels like SoundCloud. So, you know, finding those gaps and filling them, that is something startups can do. So let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about data for decision making. Um, how can startups probably make best use of data for their own decision making? Especially I'm thinking of, of the context where maybe they might not have as much data as compared to larger companies. You're right. Uh, the lack of data or the lack of good data can definitely be a challenge. And that can be addressed by using proxies, using something that's good enough, if not perfect, and planning to course correct. By that, I mean spelling out the assumptions up front, testing and learning, refining those assumptions iteratively over time and in parallel planning for not what's next but what's after that which includes prioritizing data collection for the longer term. So uh, Ruchi, what are some best practices in terms of utilizing data for decision making that you think everyone can you know benefit from? 
I'd say first would be identifying what kinds of data would best help inform decisions. So are we utilizing representative samples? Is the sample size large enough? Is it really enough to be useful? Then drawing valid inferences from this data, and by that I mean understanding there's a difference between correlation and causation. Uh, understanding that if you mine a large enough data set, some patterns will arise, especially if we don't have any pre-specified hypotheses. But that doesn't necessarily mean these patterns are useful or, or applicable to us. Right? So a very good use of data mining is to generate the hypotheses and test them out on other data sets. Presenting and labeling these conclusions the right way to drive behavior, that's something I learned the hard way. Can we do it in life? I wish somebody had told me about um, this disproportionate impact of labeling on how data-driven insights are utilized. Can you give us some more examples of how labeling can make a difference? Let me think. Climate change. That's a very neutral term. Because change can be good or bad. But global warming makes it clear that the planet is warming up, the ice caps are melting, and there's more of an urgency to it, right? So we're describing the same thing, but with more urgency. Another one, uh, surveillance state, which sounds like your rights are being trampled upon. But pre-crime, like in that movie, sounds like you know, you're preventing crime, saving lives, there's nothing wrong with that. And people are okay with living in a surveillance state in that movie because lives are being saved. Another one, imposter syndrome, which is a syndrome which is almost halfway to a disease. So if I have it, it sounds like my responsibility to get it fixed. But if we call it the confidence penalty, it sounds like it's the environment that needs to change and that's everybody's collective responsibility. So again, it's the same phenomenon. We're labeling it in a way that shifts the responsibility onto the environment as opposed to individual. Wow, great. Thanks, Rishi. And now to end the podcast on a more personal note, is there a book that has had an impact on you? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, most recently, How to Change by Karen Milkman. Uh, she's a professor of behavior science at Wharton. It's a pretty popular book in January and people start working on the New Year's resolutions. Uh, so it's based on Professor Milkman's research on behavior change and goes into overcoming barriers that get between who you are today and who you want to be, like forgetfulness or being impulsive or procrastination. She also hosts a podcast, you know, like, like it's called Choiceology. Check it out. I'd recommend it. Thank you so much, Richie, for being a part of our podcast. Thank you, Aiden. It's great fun chatting with you.